This is Caleb Hart, and he just achieved a time previously thought impossible in Final Fantasy VII speedrunning. It's like a huge weight just got lifted off my sh shoulders, man. Over the last 20 years, that's been a common theme in FF7 speedrunning. Someone says that something is impossible, and eventually, they're proven wrong. From humble beginnings in online forums to present-day live streams, we're about to see how the speedrun went from a relatively fast, glitchless playthrough to the broken mess that it is today. This is the history of Final Fantasy VII Any% Percent World Records. Speedruns are notorious for having incredible skips, but one thing you won't want to skip is this video's sponsor, Unpaid Intern. Unpaid Intern is a free, endless runner game for mobile and browser, and every week you can compete with groups of other players of your skill level for a chance to win $100. And the best part is, the competitions are completely free with unlimited tries. Jump, sidestep, leap, and smash your way through coworkers and modern office obstacles as you work your way up the ranks to challenge your bosses. The game has no ads, no pay to win stipulations, it doesn't sell your data, and you don't even need to install it to play. You just go to unpaidintern.com and you're ready to go right in your browser. If you click the link in the description, you can start climbing the corporate ladder now, and not only will you receive one of each in-game item, you'll also be entered into the next cash prize competition. So what are you waiting for? Start playing Unpaid Intern now at the link below. And with that, let's get into the video. The narrative progression for FF7 is linear, with 29 bosses being required to defeat if you want to reach the end as fast as possible. Along the way, you'll visit various towns and points of interest with minimal backtracking, and the first completed run happened all the way back in 2003. It was done by Garland the Great. There's no video, but his blog says that it clocked in at 11 hours and 9 minutes. He wrote a guide so others could try the run for themselves. And it's worth noting that this wasn't done in one sitting, but was a segmented run, where you grind a section until you're happy with it, then move on to the next, which was common back then for longer speedruns. Garland would post to the Speed Demos archive forum, claiming that a sub 9 hour run is possible, but that sub 7 will never happen, and that a time around 8 hours and 30 minutes is the limit for the game. It's also worth mentioning that in 2006, a glitch hunter named Brutal found something he called Paralysis Dodge, where under certain conditions, you could move around during cutscenes you were supposed to be frozen in. He couldn't find a use for it in the context of a speedrun, so for now, it wouldn't be useful. Which brings us to 2007, when the first record with video proof would be set. A regular across the multiple Final Fantasy forums, Faringa decided to complete a segmented run using Garland's guides, so let's take a look at the battle system, then go over some of the other strats. The combat system runs on active battle time, with each character and enemy being able to act when their ATB bar fills up. Regular attacks, abilities, and magic all use the same bar, but to use limit breaks, which are ultimate attacks, a separate bar is required to fill that goes up as you take damage. To unlock different magic and abilities, you need to equip objects called materia to your weapons and armor. We'll cover these as they become relevant, so for now, let's look at one of the first bosses you'll encounter, Motorball. The early game is filled with two types of bosses, run killers that have a high chance of game overing you, and pace killers that won't end a run, but will put it significantly behind, and the latter case is the category that Motorball falls into. There's not much to this boss as its pattern is scripted, with your goal being to defeat him before he reaches his fifth move, which is always rolling fire, a devastating attack which hits every party member. You don't need to worry about rolling fire unless he lands a crit and forces you to heal, otherwise you throw grenades and have cloud cast lightning, as that's his weakness. Since this is a segmented run, Faringa could reset on any boss he didn't get good RNG on and try again. 
so we'll only look at two more bosses. But first, I want to show off the only skip this run makes use of, Zolom Skip. Near the middle of Disc 1, when the party is heading to the Mithril Mine, you need to cross an area known as the Midgar Marshes, where one of the only overworld enemies resides, Midgar Zolom. Zolom stalks you once you enter the marsh, and the fight is supposed to be inevitable, but there is a trick you can use in segmented runs to avoid it. If you save the game in a certain spot, you can manipulate the spawn point of the Zolom, so you can make it across the marsh in one shot without triggering an encounter. It's not guaranteed to work, but since Faringa can reset as much as he wants with no time loss, he just needs to find an attempt where it works and continue the run. Deeper into Disc 1, we encounter the next pace killer, Materia Keeper, which is typically a long fight, but there is a way to defeat it very quickly. There's a battle mechanic called Lucky Sevens, where if a character or enemy has exactly 7,777 HP, they will deal that much damage on their attacks while in this state, but it has a special property when combined with the poison status effect. When a character takes poison damage, the game is coded in such a way that they deal damage to themselves, and when poison and Lucky Sevens are active on a character or enemy, they will self-target for massive damage. For Materia Keeper, there's a setup that exploits Lucky Sevens and has its self-target for massive poison damage, and even though this is a segmented run, it took Faringa 10 hours to get the correct pattern. The next boss we need to look at is Red Dragon that takes place in the Ancient Temple near the end of Disc 1. There's no trick with Lucky Sevens for this fight. Instead, the powerhouse strat of the run makes its grand entrance. This is Power Soul. Power Soul is a weapon for Tifa that's picked up in Mount Nibel just before you fight Materia Keeper. It doesn't boast huge stats and only has slots for 4 Materia, but this isn't what makes it special. It has two additional properties that increase her damage exponentially. If Tifa's HP is in critical levels, her damage output with Power Soul doubles, and if she's under the Death Sentence status effect, it quadruples. And these effects stack, meaning she does 8 times normal damage if both conditions are true. Death Sentence is an enemy ability that can be learned by using the enemy skill materia in battle and then being hit by the move you want to learn. It puts a 60 second clock on the target and kills them when it expires, and players learn Death Sentence while in Cosmo Canyon, which is a bit before Mount Nibel. If the 8 axe multiplier wasn't enough, runners also grab the materia for Death Blow earlier in the game, an ability that has one third accuracy but always hits for a critical or 2 times damage, and it stacks with Power Soul, for a total multiplier of 16. This doesn't make Red Dragon free, you still need to get Tifa into critical HP and have her death blows hit. To make the fight easier, Cloud's Cross Slash Limit Break is used to keep the boss paralyzed, as death blow can't miss on paralyzed targets, and it took Faringa 5 hours to get a perfect fight with this strat. The rest of the game plays out the same, using Power Soul to deal massive damage on the bosses, with the final four bosses, Genova Synthesis and the three forms of Sephiroth, being safe fights where not much can go wrong. Beringa's run clocked in at 8 hours, 35 minutes, and 9 seconds, but I need to put an asterisk beside it and explain a couple things about record keeping. First, it was segmented and not real time. The rest of the runs we'll be looking at are all real time, but I felt it should be included because it's the first run with video proof and later runs build upon the strats it used. Second, it was done on PC, which is a separate category from console runs due to hardware differences. For the rest of the video, we'll only be looking at console runs. And one more thing, all of the runs we're looking at are in the No Slots category. Slots is a limit break for Kate Sith that can be manipulated to make every boss fight trivial, and runners don't use it in this category. Which brings us out of the era of segmented runs, and into the era of real-time attack single segment. Things would get very slow for FF7 over the next three years, but there are two events that need to be looked at, a potential for RNG manipulation, and a glitch that appeared to skip Cosmo Canyon. Brutal would post on the forum asking if anyone had looked into the game's RNG system, hoping to find a way to manipulate random encounters. He got a reply from Terence Ferguson stating that while Final Fantasy VII's randomness was very bad, 
there is absolutely no way to predict when and where you'll battle beforehand. About a year after this in 2008, a video was uploaded to YouTube appearing to show a Cosmo Canyon skip. Normally, when you approach the canyon on the overworld, the buggy you're riding in hits a trigger and malfunctions so you're forced to enter the town, but this video clearly showed the malfunction trigger being skipped. No one could figure out how a skip worked, or if it was even real. Not to mention that skipping Cosmo Canyon would leave you without Death Sentence, a key ability for Power Soul, so talk of the skip faded into obscurity. Aside from these events, not much happened after Faringa's run. That is, until 2011, when the first single segment run would be completed. Performed on November 11th, 2011, Pingval is a Japanese runner that endeavored to complete the first single segment run. He ran on the Japan INT version of the game, which has faster text than the North American version. But aside from that, it's largely the same. So let's jump in. You're probably expecting him to fight the Zalem, but even in an RTA setting, it's faster to save and quit, then load back in with the clock running. So he resets the Zalem's position and goes across the field, where he immediately sets up a skip. Normally, after the Zalem section, you're greeted with a small cutscene when you approach the cave. But if you manage to open and close the menu on the same frame that the cutscene would trigger, you'll end up skipping it entirely and can proceed into the cave. This was the first skip ever implemented in the run, and it saves about 20 seconds, but there's plenty of bosses we haven't seen yet, so let's take a look at the remaining Disc 1 pace killers. Around the midpoint of Disc 1, you'll run into Bottom Swell, and his fight boils down to landing poison, but unlike Materia Keeper, there isn't a Lucky 7 strat involved. The reason Poison is important is because he has certain idle animations that for some reason cause the damage ticks to happen twice. After you reach a damage threshold, he starts using an attack called Water Polo that locks a party member in a sphere and damages them over time. This needs to be dispelled by targeting the Water Polo with a spell, and things have a chance to spiral out of control here since a fully Water Polo team results in a game over. If you can avoid getting Water Poloed repeatedly, the fight shouldn't be too difficult or costly, and not long after, you're in for another pace killer, Genova Birth. This fight is very straightforward as you lob grenades and use limit breaks when they come up, but due to the damage she's capable of putting out, she more than earns the title of pace killer. Random target lasers and full party attacks are her main source of damage, but the worst thing she can do is single target the same character repeatedly as you'll be forced to heal, losing time but Pingval manages to defeat her in just over 3 minutes. He proceeds to finish off Disc 1, which has a rematch with Genova, and then plows through the bosses on Disc 2 like a man on a mission, triumphantly arriving at Midgar, the last area before Disc 3. Midgar is a long section, with a cutscene, minor boss fight, and Hojo, a three-phase boss. Across his three phases, there's a total of 69,000 HP to cut down, with Power Soul putting in most of the work but there is a special mechanic we should look at that runners call weight tricking. If you go to the menu and look at the ATB options, you'll see three settings. Active, where the ATB bar fills in real time with no interruptions. Weight, where it pauses when doing certain actions. And Recommended, which is a blend of the previous two. If weight is selected, when you enter any submenus or put your cursor over someone to target them, neither your nor the enemy's ATB bars will fill. With the weight setting, you can abuse the ATB freeze so that while your characters are doing animations, the enemies don't get to charge their ATB bars, which results in less actions from them, adding a huge safety net to lots of fights. Overall, Pingval performed some minor tweaks and changes across the entire run, and when the dust settled, what do you think his final time was? Recall that Garland theorized a near-perfect time for a segmented run saving at the bottom of the crater would be around 8.30, and that still leaves the final four bosses and some random encounters, so surely an RTA run couldn't come close, right? Pingval's final time would be 8 hours, 30 minutes, and 14 seconds. Even without the discovery of major skips, bosses getting optimized with Power Soul strats brought a new level of consistency to the game, giving Pingval a single segment time that was previously thought impossible. There was a year gap between Pingval's record and the next, but that doesn't mean things weren't happening in the community. On the contrary, people were hard at work finding skips, of which five would be found, and the runner to route them in would be Puwexel. 
He credits Brutal and another runner named Whippy for helping him with routing in all of the skips, which is no easy task as we're about to see. So let's get started. The first skip that we see used is a method for skipping the Zolom that doesn't involve resetting. The Zolom is designed to home in on Cloud, so if it hits a wall, it bounces off and reorients itself to your position, and it's quite a bit faster, so the fight was supposed to be unavoidable, or so runners thought. If you can get the Zolom to bounce in a certain direction, you can time your run so that you get across the swamp to barely make it to the safe zone. This does take some setup, as it's not easy to get the Zolom to cooperate, with Puexel losing over a minute, but it can be faster than the save and quit method if you get it to work quickly. The next skip takes place at the midpoint of the run, and it's appropriately called the Shell Hut skip. It contains a chest and the materia for enemy skill, which lets us learn Death Sentence to buff Power Soul, and when you enter it normally, a cutscene plays and you're given the option to rest. The hitbox for the chest is large enough that you can trigger it from the second floor, and if you open the chest at the same time you confirm the dialogue for the rest sequence, the game will start the transition, except you have full control of your character, which lets you grab the materia while the game plays out the rest, which also lets you skip the second small cutscene. This would be the first instance of paralysis dodge that Brutal found being used in the speedrun, and it wouldn't be the last. If we look at the northern cave just before the end of the game, we see it's also used for the save crystal glitch. The save crystal glitch surprisingly involves a save crystal and saves about 30 seconds. At the party split section in the northern cave, you can drop a save crystal from your inventory at the same time you enter the hitbox to climb down a stalagmite. The game will spawn a dialogue to confirm your action, which stays on screen while the cutscene starts. And when Cloud gets in position, you can select yes on the dialogue and break out of the cutscene early. The Zolom, Shell Hut, and Save Crystal glitches collectively save about a minute, but I said there were 5 new glitches used in this run, and what if I told you the next glitch saves almost 10 minutes, because a skip was found for the second Midgar segment. The Midgar revisit is very long, and about a minute into its opening cutscene, you're shown a brief glimpse of where you'll fight Hojo before it takes you back to go through a mini-boss and more cutscenes. It turns out that Cloud is paralyzed just off-screen when you're watching Hojo, and the trigger to start the fight with him is a single frame away from where Cloud is standing. If you're guessing players found a way to dodge paralysis, that would be a good guess, but that's not how this skip works. When this cutscene is started, the developers actually implemented the paralysis incorrectly, and you have a single frame of control over Cloud, which is just enough movement to trigger the fight, skipping the parts of Midgar that are supposed to happen before it. This was the biggest single skip found by far, but it wouldn't be the most significant. And what if I told you we've been seeing it in action this entire run? Remember how Terence Ferguson said that even though the random encounter RNG was implemented very poorly, that it still wasn't possible to manipulate? It turns out he was wrong. In fact, he couldn't have been further from the truth. Brutal and Whippy would look deeper into the RNG, and they discovered that each step Cloud takes when walking or running corresponds with a precise increment in the RNG for certain events. They applied this knowledge to random encounters and quickly discovered that they could manipulate when they would occur. Wexel was aided by the duo to create his step route, and if we look at a run he did at the Crystals for Life marathon the month prior, we see the step route was developed to just before Motorball on Disc 1, but in this world record, the trio had worked all the way up to Disc 2. Due to how RNG works, they couldn't eliminate encounters completely, and since overworld encounters run on a different system, those couldn't be affected at all. It's hard to say how much time this saved exactly, but it definitely helped, and it can even affect certain boss battles. In the Genova birth fight, it's possible to have the encounter be a preemptive attack, which means the boss will be facing backwards and you'll get a round of attacks before it joins the rotation. Normally, this would be entirely random, but with a complex step route, it's possible to have this happen every time. The preemptive fight doesn't change the strat, you still want to use limit breaks and grenades, you just get more damage in before the boss can act. And since we're on the topic of bosses, let's talk about the biggest strategy change since Power Soul strats were introduced. The enemy skill materia can be used to get more than just death sentence, and one move in particular proved to be very valuable to the run, Big Guard. It's learned from the beach plug enemy near Cosmo Canyon, which is a random encounter, so it requires some farming, 
But that's not the only issue. Big Guard is a party buff that enemies won't cast on you normally, so you need to use the Manipulate Materia to control an enemy's turn and force it to target the party. And since Manipulate doesn't have perfect accuracy, there can be some grinding involved. So why is Big Guard a big deal? It casts Haste, Barrier, and M Barrier on the entire party, which means the rate your ATB gauge fills is doubled, and all physical and magic damage you take is halved while it's active. And there's no better fight to see it in action than Red Dragon. One of the big problems with Red Dragon is that if he crits a party member and kills them, it's likely going to be a game over, or at best, you're losing a huge amount of time healing. Since Faringa's run, there were two big improvements to the fight however. Big Guard was routed in to mitigate damage, and the Sadness status effect was intentionally put on the party. Sadness is a status effect that makes you take 30% less damage from physical and magical attacks, but also halves the rate at which your ATB gauge fills. When combined with Big Guard, you keep the damage reduction of both spells, but lose the penalty to your ATB gauge due to haste being cast. Sadness essentially keeps you alive so you can cast Big Guard, which gives you more leeway to set up death sentence combos. But it's not the only fight that Big Guard was routed into. This is Demon's Gate. Demon's Gate takes place almost immediately after Red Dragon, and it's one of the biggest run killers in the game. The boss has three main attacks and follows a semi-set pattern, with it typically doing two single target rock drops followed by a cave-in that targets everyone. Since the rock targets are random, this can make getting Tifa into critical HP very risky, as you need to get her low, then cast Big Guard and hope she doesn't get hit by a falling rock or cave-in. But there's also his third attack, Demon Rush. This is his deadliest attack, but you do get some warning before it's executed, as he starts waving his arms around before using it. It hits for massive physical damage to the entire party, but he'll only use it after you've dealt a certain amount of damage. So the new strat revolves around getting Power Soul online and pacing your damage for survivability. With all of these new skips and strats, Puexel made his way to Sephiroth and was able to set a final time of 8.20.14, exactly 10 minutes ahead of Pingval's time, and the first live-streamed record of the game, thus ushering in the Twitch era in Final Fantasy VII speedrunning. Puexel's record was good, but it did have places to be improved. He had to farm a few encounters for the big guard enemy to spawn. There were some bosses that didn't cooperate, and it took him a while to set up the Zalem skip. Unlike in the previous era of FF7 speedrunning, we wouldn't have to wait half a decade for a new run, because less than a month after Puexel's record, the community entered the Era of Carnage. Papa needs a new pair of shoes. Come on, Tifa, do it for me. That was a YOLO fight, dude. That was a YOLO fight. Oh, this is gonna be close. Oh god, I think we're good. Yes! Okay, we're in this. We're f in this, dude. Carnage64 is a longtime Final Fantasy VII speedrunner and he'd been doing runs at the same time as Puexel. His first record came on May 16th, but it only survives in the corner of his next record as a comparison video, and he beat Puexel by 38 seconds. We're not going to zoom in and watch a pixelated run, so let's have a look at his first fully recorded record set on May 23rd, as it contains some interesting improvements. His early game starts off great, as he bounces between being 7 and 37 seconds ahead. Most of the time save came from getting favorable RNG with bosses, and it's worth mentioning that Motorball had its strat changed based on how many grenades drop on the way to its fight, which allows for a bit more consistency. Motorball's development was relatively minor, but Carnage changed the Materia Keeper strat in a big way by cutting out the Lucky 7's trick. He still used Poison and put Red 13 in as the caster since you get his Seraph Comb weapon in Cosmo Canyon. Sadness is used on the party to limit damage and manage the ATB gauge, and instead of taking time to set up a Lucky 7's kill, Carnage has Tifa use Power Soul to burst the boss down. Despite the new strat, the fight starts off about as bad as it can, with Tifa getting KO'd. Overall, he lost about 30 seconds on the fight, but he's still over 2 minutes ahead. You're probably wondering how he saved so much time earlier, 
Let's rewind to find out. Looking back at Puexel's record, it took him about a minute to set up the Zalem skip, but Carnage didn't want to lose a minute. In fact, he didn't want to wait any time at all, so he YOLO'd it. We're trying it. We're looking good. We're looking good. Alright, we gotta run. By the skin of his teeth, he made it across. He did miss the cutscene skip, but the time loss from that is only a few seconds with the Yolo Zalem saving a whopping 56 seconds. This wasn't the only place he saved big over Puexel. When it came to farming the big guard skill, he got it on his second fight, putting him almost three minutes ahead. He managed to keep this pace going until the end of the game, where there are two bosses we should look at, Carry Armor and Diamond Weapon. Carry Armor is the final run killer you'll encounter, and it gets this title for one big reason, Lapis Laser. It's an attack that targets the entire party for huge magic damage, and since it has a 1 in 3 chance to use it each round, it's paramount that you deal with it quickly. Sadness and Big Guard are used to mitigate damage, and while this doesn't entirely protect you against bad patterns, it does allow you to negate further Lapis Lasers by using another enemy skill, Magic Hammer. Magic Hammer drains 100 MP from the target. And since Lapis Laser costs 10, and Carry Armor only has 200, you can nullify Lapis Laser if everything goes well. A fully powered Tifa takes over the fight from here, and then it's not long before you encounter Diamond Weapon. This is the final boss before the boss rush at the end, and it has the potential to steal huge amounts of time. Diamond Weapon is immune to physical damage until it's hit with a number of summons or a single limit break. Once one of those conditions are met, he will go into a countdown where after three turns, it unleashes the Diamond Flash attack. If this happens, you need to repeat the cycle and will lose minutes, so it's important to kill it before the countdown finishes. To accomplish this, Sid is equipped with his ultimate weapon, the Venus Gospel, and the Command Materia Double Cut, which lets him hit twice every attack. It's integral that Tifa lands her Power Souls attacks here, otherwise another cycle will trigger, which is what happened in Carnage's previous run. But he has a great fight, and avoids getting a second cycle, putting him 5.5 minutes ahead. The final bosses aren't much to cover, as Tifa makes quick work of them at this point, and he saves a bit more time through to the end, for a final time of 8.13.52. Looking back, this may seem like an unbeatable run, but there were definitely places for improvement. You may have noticed the counter in the bottom of the screen, and this is used to track encounters throughout the run. As amazing as it may sound, Carnage never used a step count for his run. In fact, he wasn't aware that Puexel used one in his record either, so the run could be improved with better RNG. And that's what Carnage set out to do, and over the next four months, he would set nine world records. With his record on August 4th, he was just under 4 minutes shy of beating the game in under 8 hours, something previously thought impossible for even a segmented run. And on August 14th, something incredible happened. Given how hard he was grinding, his previous run had a lot of segments with very good RNG. So good, in fact, that he was in the red for the entire first hour of the run, until he defeated Motorball. He'd get further ahead after a near-perfect Zalem skip, which saved a ton of time over his last record where he was caught by the Zalem and had to flee the encounter. He snowballs the momentum into a full two minutes of time save when he's three hours in. This is the pace he needs if he's going to set the first sub-eight hour run. Interestingly, he tries to steal an item from two different encounters on Mount Corel but fails, and we'll talk about what's going on there a bit later. Deeper in the run, Red Dragon does its best to steal as much time as it can, but Carnage evens it out with a great Demon's Gate fight. With three and a half hours of run left, he's on a good pace, but he needs to find almost two minutes of time save to get the sub-8. The run oscillates between being on pace for the sub-8 and coming up just short. And after another Genova fight, he's almost three minutes ahead, but due to poor RNG with encounters, he bleeds almost a minute of it leading into carry armor. Don't miss, baby. Come on. All right, all right, all right. All right, that was... She missed, but we're okay. He was three minutes ahead, with 50 minutes left in the run. The only fights that remained were Diamond Weapon and the final boss rush. Normally, there isn't much time to save between these two splits, as it's really only possible to lose time if Tifa misses attacks on Diamond Weapon. 
However, in his previous run, he had two encounters picking up some items on the way to Diamond Weapon, and in this run, he had zero, which saved 40 seconds. After Diamond Weapon, he was three and a half minutes ahead. Somewhere in the final split, with very little RNG, he had to find 20 seconds of time save to get the sub-8. There was one final hope. On your way to the boss rush, there's a segment called the Final Descent, where you jump down a series of rocks, and each rock has a chance of triggering a battle that can take between 15 to 25 seconds to run from. In his last run, he had two encounters that stole 47 seconds from him. If he had just one encounter, the sub-8 was still possible. One encounter and a first turn run. His hopes were still alive. A second encounter. Unfortunately for Carnage, the sub-8 was now out of reach. He'd get a total of three encounters on his way down, but due to how well he played in the rest of the game, he PB'd by almost three minutes for a new time of eight hours and 51 seconds. The sub-8 was just on the horizon. Carnage's run was very good, but it wasn't unbeatable. The Red Dragon fight had a lot of time to be saved in it, some enemy skills took multiple attempts to learn, and there was also the number of random encounters that could always be lower. So while this was a strong run, it wasn't invincible. Things would quiet down over the next few months. Carnage would still grind runs, but running against his current PB was a daunting task. It was going to take a special run to be able to compete with it, and exactly three months to the day, a new record would get set. And it wasn't by Carnage. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you may have heard of Kart 7 before. She's the person that discovered how the new boost technique in Super Mario Kart worked. And while Carnage was setting records, she was learning the run and had developed her own step count that covered the entire game. The race for who would set the first sub-8 was on. On November 18th, 2013, Kart 7 would get on a run, and she didn't just bring a full step count, she also brought a new skip. Early in the game, you arrive at Wall Market, where you need to gain access to Don Corneo's mansion by completing the dress quest. It has three possible outcomes, but the fastest for the speedrun is getting Cloud selected as Don Corneo's bride-to-be. The dressmaker is in the local watering hole, where you have some dialogue to get through before you can exit, but there's also an NPC in the bathroom you can talk with as well, and the game doesn't disable your movement while talking with them. This means you can keep their dialogue open while talking with the dressmaker, and since the game doesn't like having different text boxes running at the same time, you get another paralysis dodge. This lets you exit the tavern without listening to the dressmaker's full dialogue, saving about 15 seconds. This wasn't a huge skip, but every second is precious when you're going for the sub-8, and it wasn't the only new trick runners were bringing to the table. The Zolom skip saw further developments. Instead of trying to bait the Zolom into going to the top left corner, runners now reoriented the camera so they were looking down the field and took refuge behind the corner of a mountain. This let them safely lure the Zolom into a wall where they could then follow it across the field to the Mithril Mines. This was a lot more consistent and eliminated having to do a YOLO run where you sometimes ran the risk of getting caught. And armed with these new tools, Kart 7 set out to make history, so let's look at the run. It gets off to a rocky start, but after bottom swell, the run starts to pick up major momentum, and one section in particular is worth looking at, Mount Coral. This is a long section with lots of enemies, so Kart 7 made sure that her step route generated encounters that were easy to flee from. Taking an encounter doesn't alter your step count since the RNG inside of battles doesn't affect the overworld RNG, so you just need to flee and hope you don't get stuck being unable to run. In her previous run, this section of the game is corrupted, so it's hard to tell how she saved 40 seconds this time, but it's likely that in her previous run, she got off step count and tried to brute force an encounter, and for good reason. Her step count forces two fights with bombs who have the right arm item that can be stolen from them. It can be used in battle to deal huge explosive damage, but it only has a 9% chance of being stolen per attempt. So runners usually try a couple times, then flee the fight, but if you manage to steal one, you're in for a huge time save later in the run, as it's used in one particular boss fight. Dying is a tragic character in the narrative, 
but the only thing tragic about him in the speedrun is the time you lose fighting him if you fail to steal a right arm. He has the potential to be a run killer if he gets a bunch of crits, but that's rare, with the typical strat being to throw 4 molotovs, but with a right arm, you can end the fight instantly, saving 3 whole turns. Thanks to the right arm, her run was over a minute ahead after dying, well on pace for the sub 8, but the game wasn't going down without a fight. There's a boss called Palmer not long after Cosmo Canyon that isn't particularly difficult, but he can be a pain if he targets the same party member repeatedly, and in this fight, he ends up killing Red, which requires a Phoenix down. This ate up most of the remaining time save, and the next split, where you farm Magic Hammer for Carry Armor, had a bad encounter, which put it in the red. She was past the halfway point, so things desperately needed to turn around, and the Red Dragon and Demon's Gate fights were just the place for it to happen. But she wasn't coming at the mercy of RNG, because Red Dragon had a brand new strat. Through Carnage's last few records, the Weight Trick strategy was being developed for several boss fights, and Red Dragon was one that it would be eagerly applied to. Some attacks in this fight have long animations, so it's advantageous to open a submenu while they're playing, which lets you chain more attacks before the enemy gets a turn. This helps reduce the volatility of Red Dragon, but doesn't eliminate the danger completely, with the plan still being to use Cross Slash to paralyze the boss so that Tifa's attacks can't miss. The strat saved 30 seconds and helped put the run back on track. Not long after this, she starts Disc 2, where in her previous run, she got off of step count and lost a ton of time to encounters, but this time she nailed it and saved huge, leaving just two bosses that could end her sub-8 pace. Carry Armor and Diamond Weapon Carry Armor took away 20 seconds due to some misses, but it's not the end of the world, as the run had snowballed into being almost 3 minutes ahead. And with a 1 cycle diamond weapon, there wasn't much stopping this from being the first sub 8 in FF7 history. Even a 4 encounter final descent barely nudged the pace. This run was destined to make history. And with the final hit on Sephiroth, the time came in. 7 58 03. The first sub 8 by almost 2 minutes. You might be thinking, what happened that she was able to save so much time? The strat development certainly helped, but even combined, the bar skip, new Zolom setup, and right arm on Dine don't equal 2 minutes of time save. So why was she able to smash the sub 8 barrier? The answer is the step route. An average encounter takes about 15 seconds to run from if you get it on the first turn, and to show how much of an impact a step route can have, let's look at the whirlwind maze. There's a part in this section where you need to pass through a strobing wall. If you're hit, you'll be sent back to the beginning and forced into an encounter you can't run from. This can be avoided with a step route, but in her previous run, she missed the timing and took the encounter, which lost a minute and 50 seconds. In the sub 8, she got through safely, which goes to show just how much effect the small things can have on the run. But this wouldn't be Kart 7's final record. She was just getting started. She would set a few more records in 2013, with a notable route change taking place where the Magic Hammer skill isn't picked up. This skill was very important for Carry Armor and another boss named Schizo, but by using a Hero Drink, the fights were made a lot faster and Magic Hammer was no longer required. However, none of these records would compare to the first she set in 2014, because it had a new boss strat and four new skips. Remember Brutal? He was still active in the community, and as a reward for Kart 7 753, he sent her a new skip in her DMs and made a post detailing how to perform the Jesse skip. In the beginning of the game, you take a train to the Sector 7 slums, where you normally have a small dialogue cutscene with Jesse. Brutal discovered that if you trigger the train conductor dialogue at the same time you talk to Jesse, you'll get a paralysis dodge and can leave the train car and re enter it to skip the cutscene and save 15 seconds. As for the skip that he DM'd her, it's not clear exactly which skip he revealed, but Cart 7 told me it was likely Barrett's skip. After defeating Motorball, you climb down a rope to escape Midgar and then pick your party for the next section of the game. But once again, Brutal found a paralysis dodge to avoid this. If you try to exit the screen at the bottom, you'll trigger the party select cutscene and be locked into it. But conveniently, Barrett is within talking distance of the trigger. 
By triggering the cutscene and talking to Barrett at the same time, you get a paralysis dodge and can leave the screen, with the game continuing to use the same party you had active. This saves about 20 seconds, quite minor as far as time saves go, but the remaining two skips are anything but small. A glitch hunter and runner named Zero Kinos discovered a skip for another animated cutscene that occurs in Junon when you revisit it later in the game. It works exactly like the Midgar skip, but with a twist. Instead of forgetting to paralyze Barrett for a frame, they forgot to paralyze him at all. His character model is invisible, but with a couple of inputs on the controller, you can get him to a loading zone and skip watching the majority of the cutscene, saving 70 seconds, bringing our total time save from new skips to a minute and 45 seconds. And there was still one more to go. Near the end of the Cosmo Canyon segment, you're in the Caves of Gi, which is home to the Stinger enemies. Stingers are mini-bosses that occur in forced encounters when you walk into spiderwebs covering the map, but Brutal discovered that if you triggered a random encounter on the frame you touch a stinger web, neither encounter would happen. A step route was developed so that encounters would be forced at the correct pixels and runners could now get through the stinger section without a worry, saving about a minute and a half in total, bringing us to just over three minutes in time save from new discoveries. On their own, the skips would make it easy for a new world record, but a new strat was developed for Demon's Gate that made the fight a lot more consistent. Since you're guaranteed to get a demon rush early in the fight, Tifa's HP was intentionally kept at a certain amount so that the attack would consistently put her into critical to get Power Soul online. This wasn't risk-free, however. If demon rush crit, then Tifa would die outright, and you'd have to go into backup strats. But when things went according to plan, you'd be able to kill Demon's Gate before he did another rush. With these new tricks, Cart 7 set the first sub-750 in January, and through to May, she set two more records, bringing the time down to a 744.39. Brutal made a post congratulating her, and said that he would release another new skip if someone could get a 742.30 time or better. So how long did it take? Unfortunately for Brutal, he wouldn't get to reveal it, because Cart 7 discovered the new skip all on her own. When you reach Calm for the first time after the Zalem skip, there are a series of flashbacks that reveal some of Cloud's past that you have to play through. They contain battles and some overworld movement, and in one of the sections, a small cutscene plays where a photographer wants to get a picture of Cloud, Tifa, and Sephiroth before you can proceed. To skip the cutscene dialogue, another paralysis dodge is used, this time by talking to the photographer at the same time as you enter the mansion, which also causes text to appear. The text box gets stuck on screen, allowing you to skip the cutscene and walk to the next loading zone. Oddly enough, this glitch only works on PlayStation, as it will softlock on other versions of the game, and it does come with a downside. With the scene skipped, Sephiroth never gets added back to the party, which means Cloud has to do all of the flashback battles himself. This required a new step route to be created, as Solo Cloud would easily be KO'd in a lot of these fights. This ends up saving more time, however, since the cutscenes are sped up now that the game doesn't have to wait for Sephiroth to run in and out of Cloud when setting up a scene. In total, the skip photographer and Sephiroth dialogue save about 50 seconds, with Cart 7 setting two more records after its discovery midway through 2015. With the record sitting at a 741 flat, the question on everyone's mind became when would Cart 7 set the sub 740? And just three days later, they got their answer but it wouldn't be by Cart 7. This player started off running Mega Man X and switched to FF7 not long after. If you're thinking it's Caleb Hart, that's a good guess, but it's actually Ajneb. Ajneb beat Cart 7's record by 14 seconds, but his run isn't notable for what went right. It's more notable for what went wrong. The RNG was obviously good since it was a new record, but to get an idea of where the record could still go, it's worth looking at what went wrong. Bottom Swell took an entire minute of time due to poison not sticking until the fifth try, with another 30 seconds being lost trying to get Manipulate to land when farming Big Guard. When he arrived at Final Descent, he had fought back to be 15 seconds behind Cart 7's world record. She had four encounters on her way down, so all he needed was three or less, and he had a shot.
a single encounter, which let Ajneb set a record that beat Kart 7 by just 14 seconds. If we look back at the major time losses and throw in some overworld encounters, it paints a picture of a record that can go well below a 740, which meant the race was on to see who would be the first to break the barrier. The photo skip wasn't the only new trick that runners were using. Diamond Weapon had a brand new strat as well. Before entering the fight, runners would intentionally lower the battle speed, which allowed them to get in two death blows per tick of its countdown. If Tifa misses death blows too many times, you can still get a second cycle, but with the extra attacks per countdown tick, it made the fight a lot more consistent. And just eight days after Ajneb took the record from Kart 7, not only did she take it back, she shattered it. The run started off great, as she was a full minute and a half ahead of her PB after beating Motorball and leaving Midgar, which was fortunate, because some random encounters during the big guard split stole away an entire minute. Leaving Disc 1, she was only 24 seconds ahead, but there was one section of the game she could save huge on, and that was Gaia's Cliff. Leading into this area is the Great Glacier section, and in her previous run, she took a random encounter. But with strict adherence to the step count, she avoided the battle and started to bring the pace back. Deeper inside of Gaia's Cliff, there's a section where you need to defeat three icicles in battle to forge your way forward. The timing for the fights can be tight, and in her PB, a set of enemies managed to take turns before Sid could get a laser off. But this time, she executed the inputs lightning fast, and everything went according to plan. She saved almost an entire minute on that section alone, setting a new gold split, with another gold coming right after on the schizo fight. The run gained some more time over the remaining splits until she was almost two and a half minutes ahead going into the final descent. Her previous run had four encounters, this time she had one, almost an entire minute saved from pure RNG. She made quick work of the boss rush, and the final blow to Sephiroth came at 7, 37, 45 over a 3 minute PB, and a new world record. Things cooled off after this record. Kart 7 would move on from Final Fantasy 7 speedrunning, which left Ajneb and Carnage who were doing regular attempts. Ajneb would eventually beat Kart 7's record by 11 seconds, and then things really slowed down. For almost two years, there wouldn't be any new records, but there was something very interesting that Brutal posted on the forums. It was titled Final Descent Manipulation, and it goes into the technical details of how you could manipulate the final descent to have zero encounters. The gist of it is that there are two variables that affect the encounters for final descent, and if you watched a random pattern for long enough, you could figure out what their values were, which told you how many encounters you'd get. He suggested using the Hojo cutscene, since it had the repeating lightning bolt animation, but this did have a problem. There was still a lot of game to play between Hojo and the Final Descent, so things could change, and a manip that was carried for that long would have to be flawless. To highlight how much of an effect this would have on the run, let's look back at Ajneb's first world record. Going into FD, he was 14 seconds behind his PB, which had 5 encounters. If he had anything more than two, a new record likely wasn't going to happen, and that's exactly what he got, narrowly beating Kart 7 by 11 seconds. But if he had received zero encounters, he could have potentially saved another 20 seconds. A manip for this would be huge, as it removed a slot machine right at the end, but it sadly wasn't thought possible in a real-time setting due to all of the variation that could happen between Hojo and the Final Descent. 2016 would see no new records, but in 2017, that would change, as the game saw its first new record in almost two years. It was almost three minutes ahead of Ajneb's, and had better RNG throughout most of the run. There weren't any new skips used in it, but not long after, a new skip would be found, and it came from a source nobody expected. Ajneb would run FF7 at Summer Games Done Quick in 2017, where he was joined on the couch by Dave Stereo and J2 Champ two accomplished runners in their own right. Considering that the run uses marathon strats and safety saves, it goes fantastic, with a final time of 7.48.04. This was the game's first appearance at a major event, but something else stole the spotlight. It wasn't anything that happened during the run, it was a comment that was left on the video. If you look deep in the comment section, you see Jesse Gordon leaving this comment. You can skip the conversation with Eris after sneaking out of her house by walking along the bottom of the screen and going behind her and proceeding to the area before the playground. 
The conversation in question happens before you head to Wall Market to do the dress quest, and it has two parts. The first, where Eris blocks your path and has a small dialogue with you, and the second, where you spend time talking at the playground. Jesse's comment would be investigated, and it turns out, the skip was legit. The loading zone for the next area has a few pixels that you can get to with the right setup, skipping the dialogue with Aerith and the playground cutscene, saving a minute and a half, but there is a catch. The cutscene trigger only checks for the player every other frame, and in order to skip the trigger and hit the load zone, you need to enter it for exactly one frame and have it be the frame it's not checking, which means this skip fails half the time with no way of influencing it. Runners just had to hope that they entered on a correct frame. The skip was found and verified in July of 2017, but a new record wouldn't be seen for a few months. Luzbell's run was so optimized that even with a minute and a half time save, the amount of things that needed to go your way still made it a difficult mountain to climb, but there was one person actively trying. Carnage 64. It had been four years since Carnage last held the record, and with a new skip, he set out to reclaim his throne. He has a good early game and hits the playground skip, then has some trouble hitting the setup for photo skip and goes slightly in the red. But with five hours of run left, there's still plenty of time to save. By this time, Carnage had started using a step route, and instead of trying to steal a right arm for dying, he opted to run from the fights and take a small time save rather than gamble 20 seconds on a 9% chance. The run was about a minute behind at this point, so things needed to turn around if this was going to be a world record. Fortunately, Carnage had a time save that was almost guaranteed to work. We haven't talked about the Palmer boss fight yet, because it's not a hard fight if you pay attention to who he targets and heal accordingly. But like the Dine fight, there's an item you can steal that can speed the fight up immensely. To refresh your memory, while you're at Cosmo Canyon, you pick up the enemy skill Death Sentence, which is integral to the run because of the damage multiplier it gives to Power Soul. But the enemy you learn it from also has the M Tentacles item that it can drop, and while learning Death Sentence, Carnage had it drop too. When used in battle, M Tentacles casts Bio 3 on an enemy, which deals good base damage and can badly poison the target. And if used in the Palmer fight, they drastically speed it up. It's lucky that Carnage managed to steal two of them, because the first didn't have its poison stick, but the second did, and he saved almost a full minute because of it. This was a major turning point for the run, and he started gaining huge chunks of time from here on out, until the unthinkable happened. Well, there goes Kate Sith. Alright. Finish this up just fine. Oh god! Just kidding. That's the only fight in the game where you can lose and continue playing. So players intentionally target their own party for a death to save time over playing the fight out. He's almost two minutes ahead at this point, which is the pace he needs for a world record. And as he was going into the diamond weapon fight, he knew the run had a chance. After cutting it close on getting a second cycle, he was one minute ahead and had this to say. If we can save a lot of time on Hojo, there's a possibility. There's a small chance. Moving into Midgar, we get to Hojo, which isn't hard since Tifa is incredibly overpowered at this point. But she can still miss her death blows, and that's precisely what happens. Tifa misses her first three attacks. With every miss, the record slips further out of reach. She hits the next four, and Carnage's chance of getting a new record all rest on the final descent. One encounter. A second encounter. If there's another, the chance at world record is gone. Two. Got it. He made it through without another fight. It all came down to how he executed the final boss rush. I've said previously that the final bosses don't have much variation, and while that is true, there are still some things that can go wrong. And in the Bizarro Sephiroth fight, Sid's health gets super low, which posed a dilemma. 
In the next fight, Safer Sephiroth will cast Shadow Flare on a single target. If it hits Sid, he will die and will force a revive as he needs to use D-Barrier on the boss so Tifa can deal max damage. And since his pace was so tight, he couldn't take the safe option and heal as that would cost too much time, so he prayed that the spell would target Cloud. Oh my god, okay. His gamble paid off. He used the high potion just to make sure Sid didn't die in case Sephiroth's wing attack critical, then moved on to the final split. Looking at his best possible time calculation, he had a chance to beat the record by one second. So he mashed dialogue as fast as possible and prayed he was fast enough. When Carnage hit the last input of the run, his final time is a 7.34.46. For the first time in Final Fantasy VII history, the record was tied. In a seven and a half hour run, a tie really is something special. For the RNG in the various splits to align so that two runs have the same time is astronomical. You can always say that Carnage would have broke the tie if he hadn't used the high potion on Cloud, but that's also true of getting one second of better RNG on any of the segments. Being set on December 23rd, this was the last record of 2017, and the tie would stand for months. The two runs were just that good. But in July of 2018, something would happen that broke the tie decisively. Before you do the dress quest, there's a pathway that's blocked by two guards that connects Wall Market and the Sector 7 slums. When you clear Wall Market, the guards leave and you can use the path as a shortcut to get back to Sector 7. But in July, Tsunamods would discover that just like Playground Skip, there's a way to hit the load zone the guards are blocking. It requires a precise setup, but it is possible and consistent with some practice. So how much time does it save? To get to Wall Market normally, you need to complete Reactor 5, which includes a boss fight, and get through the entire Eris introduction. But with Guard Skip, you avoid all of this and save 18 minutes. There are two important things I want to point out with this skip. The first is that you need to do the Materia tutorial with Barrett before doing the skip. If you don't, the game never gives you access to the Materia menu. And second, when you get to Wall Market, Aerith mysteriously joins your party at level 1, with this as her hard-coded name. If you acquire her the normal way, her preset name is Aerith, so the game appears to have two different hard-coded values for her name. Have fun debating which is correct in the comments, because with an 18-minute save, we've got some records to look at. With that much time to save, anyone that was close to the world record would have a shot at breaking it, and Dave Stereo's PB was one minute behind Carnage and Luz Bell's tie. He did use Guard Skip, but some things went terribly wrong, so he set out to correct them and hoped to set a new world record. It took him a couple of tries to find the correct position for guard skip, but 30 seconds of time loss isn't a big deal with an 18 minute skip, so he presses on and eventually arrives at the two splits that stole massive amounts of time from him previously, Genova Birth and the Stinger Skip. In his last run, he messed up the step count going into Genova, which meant he didn't get a preemptive fight, but this time he nailed the step count and saved over a minute. And when it came to Stinger Skip, a new route had been devised that required a couple of frame-perfect inputs, but he had no problem hitting them this time, and was almost six minutes ahead. Split after split, the time save kept adding up. Even a bad carry armor that stole a minute wasn't going to stop this run, and even with a four-encounter final descent, the pace Dave had built up was unstoppable. When he delivered the final blow to Saver Sephiroth, he knew he'd just done something special. And when the dust settled, he lowered the record by almost 7 minutes, setting the first sub-7.30. There was a lot of room for the record to improve. Dave's run had used up 7 of the 18 minutes afforded by Guard Skip, and 3 people rose to the challenge of squeezing everything out of it. Carnage, Luz Bell, and a newcomer named Zeal. Over the course of these 4 records, the trio would squeeze almost everything out of Guard Skip with Zeal having the final record of 2017 on December 23rd. The time was 16 minutes away from a sub-7, but it was considered to be practically impossible due to everything that would need to go right. For comparison's sake, the same day Zeal achieved his new record, a task was released using current strats that finished in 6.44.19. 
This was the theoretical limit of the game with current strats, but it did a lot of things players couldn't do, like perfect menuing and manipulations that prevented overworld encounters, but it did show that there was still a lot of time to potentially save. Luz Bell would take the record back in February, with the time save from Guard Skip being almost fully used up, and I think it's time we went back to 2008. Remember this video I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out that not only was this video uploaded by Brutal, but the skip it showed was legit. There's a lot of history with this skip, and I've made a video covering it in detail, but here's a rough timeline. Brutal knew about the skip back in 2008, and as the game got more popular, he would give hints to runners and glitch hunters about its existence. In 2016, he sent out codes to different runners, and together, they contained a hint to the skip. When the code was deciphered, it spelled out CC Skip, with everyone speculating that it had to be for Cosmo Canyon. And in 2018, after a few more puzzles, everything would be revealed. Brutal confirmed that the original video was uploaded by him, and that the skip was indeed for Cosmo Canyon. For over 10 years, he had kept this glitch secret and given out hints hoping that someone else would solve the puzzle. You're probably wondering why, and the answer is, because the glitch was only possible by dumb luck. If you try to enter the desert while mounted on a chocobo, you're forcibly dismounted and get a text box, but if you point the joystick away when dismounting, you'll enter a glitch state where the text is still on screen. If you cancel the text box with the same input you use to enter the buggy, the glitch will persist while you're riding the vehicle. Once in this state, if you go to Cosmo Canyon, the buggy won't malfunction and force you into the town, Instead, you can drive by and skip the entire section, but things weren't this easy. First, getting the position for the buggy and dismount was very hard, and second, if you took a single overworld encounter while in the glitched buggy, the trick would fail. Overworld encounters run on a different system than encounters in towns and dungeons. Instead, they rely on Cloud's coordinates in the overworld, the camera's position, and the in-game timer. Since you can't know what pace you'll be on when arriving at the setup for the glitch, the in-game time component makes this trick almost impossible to execute. For these reasons, Brutal held on to the skip. He didn't want runs to live or die by a skip that relies on not getting encounters, which would be extremely lucky given that the journey to Cosmo Canyon from the setup takes about 30 seconds. For now, the glitch wouldn't be used in runs. The setup and random chance involved were too much to risk going for after playing for two hours, so players kept grinding using guard skip. In July of 2019, Zeal would set three more records, a 7.13, a 7.12, and a 7.11. The time was approaching a sub-7, but without a new skip, it was going to be almost impossible to achieve. Things then went quiet for a year. Zeal was busy with other games, and he had optimized the run to such a point that lowering it wouldn't be an easy task. In June 2020, he came back and lowered the record by another minute. Then in July, he lowered it again with a run that had very good RNG when acquiring the Big Guard skill and just two encounters in the final descent. This run was just 12 minutes off of his sum of best splits, so if things were going to improve, there would need to be a run with the best RNG to date or a new skip had to be introduced. And I'll give you one guess as to what happened. It wasn't better RNG, it was Cosmo Canyon skip. Mies Baker had been looking at ways to carry a manipulation on the overworld and found one that could be used in runs. It required starting the setup at a certain in-game time, so if you arrived early, you'd have to wait a bit before you started executing. But the time saved was well worth it in this case. Since the other part of the manipulation involves Cloud's coordinates, it was mapped out so you only need to hold cardinal directions. This way, you'll encounter the chocobo on a certain pixel so that you only need to hold left once the battle is over, which gets you in the perfect line for the desert text dismount onto the buggy. Once in the vehicle, a route was created that has you stop on certain pixels and change directions, with this only being possible due to the buggy having precise movement. If it moved inconsistently, this trick would be TAS only, but it did come with problems. Much like people speculated 10 years ago, skipping Cosmo Canyon is a big deal. You miss out on experience from some battles, and more importantly, you no longer pick up Death Sentence to bring Power Soul to its full power. It can be picked up later, just before the Shell Hut skip, but it meant that three important bosses had to be rerouted, Materia Keeper, Red Dragon, and Demon's Gate. 
Zeal would be the first person to do CC skip in a run, so let's have a look at everything that changed. He arrives at the skip just before the halfway point of the run, and nails it first try. It saves about 17 minutes, so at this point, things were looking very good. Which brings us to the first boss reroute, Materia Keeper. This fight had seen considerable overhaul since we last looked at it when Carnage used Power Soul instead of a Lucky 7 setup. A tactic was developed where you used Bio with Red, then manipulate Tifa with Mini so you could stack exactly 99 damage, which put the boss into Lucky 7s for the Poison Tick. But since we skipped Cosmo Canyon, we're missing Red Seraph Comb in addition to Death Sentence. In the post-CC skip strat, Red is replaced with Kate Sith, and the strat changes to have Tifa cast Big Guard and Cloud use Bio. Then, a mini Tifa manipulates the damage a bit slower to get the Lucky 7's tick to kill. When Zeal defeats Materia Keeper, he's 5.5 minutes ahead of his PB, with 3 hours of run left. So let's fast forward to everyone's favorite boss duo, Red Dragon and Demon's Gate. Missing out on Death Sentence is a big deal for these two fights, so to compensate, Cloud gets equipped with the Yoshi Yuki, a weapon that gets a 100% damage increase per dead party member. To get this online, Aerith is intentionally killed if she doesn't die in the boss's opening attack, with Kate Sith running support by using Big Guard and Potions. Demon's Gate follows a similar pattern, with Aerith being KO'd to turn on the Yoshi Yuki bonus. Kate Sith still heals this fight, but he'll also throw Molotovs, and you'll need to manage your ATB closely so you can recast Barrier after a Demon's Rush. These strats are obviously slower than having Death Sentence, and if we look at the full picture for CC Skip, we see that it saves 17 minutes, but loses 7 minutes across the boss fights compared to Death Sentence strats, for a final time save of 10 minutes. Zeal is over 5 minutes ahead after this pair of bosses when he stops to pick up Death Sentence, Things go pretty good from here. He does execute a new trick near the end of the run, and we'll get to what that is in a bit. After the last input, the first run to use Cosmo Canyon Skip finished with a time of 7.07.40, a two minute improvement over his last record, which meant there was still plenty of time to save. Cosmo Canyon Skip saved a lot of time, but even with its inclusion, the run was just on the cusp of sub 7 being a possibility. It wasn't going to be a great run that achieved the time, it was going to be an exceptional run. So Zeal got to work. 10 days later, he lowered the time another 2 minutes, and 10 days after that, it went down another 2, putting the record at a 7.03.31. Part of the time saved was due to a development with the CC skip. A new setup was found that ran at an earlier interval, which made it 2.5 minutes faster if you could get there in time. However, there was another development. This was the trick at the end of the game that Zeal executed in his first record with CC Skip. If you haven't guessed, Final Descent finally got manipulated. If you recall, the reason a Final Descent manip wasn't possible was twofold. First, one of the two important variables couldn't be manipulated easily. And second, figuring out what that variable's current value was required looking at the fluctuations in a pattern. Initially, the suggested pattern was the electricity in the Hojo cutscene, which wasn't a good option due to the amount of gameplay between observing its value and arriving at the final descent. But as seems to be the case with FF7, if something is possible, it's only a matter of time before it's routed into a run. Working off of the information posted by Brutal back in 2015, Luzbell looked into finding a way to route final descent manipulations into the run. In the North Crater, there are certain screens that advance the list RNG reliably, so by taking a peek at the stone value with the electricity in Hojo, you could wait on these other screens to increase the list value to generate better encounters. A spreadsheet was created that showed runners what encounters they could possibly receive based on what the stone value was at Hojo. Then, to manip better ones, they would wait on these screens to increase the list value. It wasn't an exact process, but it was better than nothing. This manip had been attempted in Zeal's last three records, and looking back at the final descents, he hit a successful two-encounter manip in his 740, then dropped the manip in his next two records, so it wasn't the most consistent trick, but it could save about 15 seconds per encounter, so runners had nothing to lose by going for it. When CC skip was first found, the record was a 709, meaning it was just barely possible to get a sub-7 time. The quicker setup saved an additional two and a half minutes, Combine this with Final Descent Manip, 
and you're looking at about an extra three minutes of time save, bringing Sub-7 more into the realm of possibility. Zeal would set another record on September 28th, and since Cosmo Canyon Skip proved that overworld manipulations were possible, it wasn't long before the techniques were applied to the Zolom, with a new skip having players wait for a specific in-game time so that the Zolom's RNG would have it in a location where a safe crossing could be made. And using this trick, he lowered the record to a 7-3-21. The road to sub-7 was clear. It was going to take good execution on all of the new tricks and solid RNG. And a month later, on October 25th, Zeal got on a run. He was about dead even with his previous record at the Zolom, but the run really picked up steam at the Red Dragon and Demon's Gate fights, with Dragon going almost perfect and the run being a minute and a half ahead after Demon's Gate. At the end of Gaia's Cliff, he's on pace to set the sub-7 if a few more splits go his way, but things get really interesting at Carry Armor. He needs to get Tifa into critical HP and has the option to use an S-Mine on her but he's not sure if that will kill her or not. So, he takes the gamble anyway. I'm not even sure if I can S-mine Tifa. I might kill her with it. I guess I have to risk it. Okay, cool. It pays off. He's saved over a minute and is almost five ahead of his PB. This has to be the sub seven. He arrives at Diamond Weapon. An opening shot that kills Tifa forces a revive, and a lack of limit break on Sid forces him to use a time-consuming summon to start the first cycle. 40 seconds are lost in the fight. He's still on pace, but there are still things that can bleed time. Tifa can miss hits on Hojo, and there's still Final Descent Manip. He had to miss one time, right? Boy, man, what a fight. A single miss on Hojo puts the fate of Sub-7 on the final descent Manip working. He does a quick calculation and comes up with his current seed being an 8 encounter final descent. Luckily, he still has a chance to manipulate it. Everything rides on a single trick that he's only pulled off in one run. To change his current seed from 8 encounters to 3, he needs to wait for 14 seconds. He arrives at the screen and takes the time loss for the manipulation. If he's right, he'll make history. If he's wrong, Sub-7 is lost. He enters the screen and lets out a sigh. Um, if we did it right, we got an encounter on 2, 5, and 11. 1, 2. An encounter on 2. Did it work, or was it just dumb luck? 4, 5. An encounter on 5. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. An encounter on eleven. The manipulation worked. Nothing was stopping Zeal at this point. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Did we really do it? Did we really do it? Top 7? Really? Out of nowhere? <laughs> that is so cool! Ah oh, man, low even 5909. After 23 years, it finally happened. Final Fantasy VII was beaten in under seven hours. The Sub-7 was a landmark for the game. Not only was it the best in this category, it was the best of any category. As the any percent slots run hadn't routed CC skip in yet, Zeal's record was the fastest run for Final Fantasy VII ever. But big things were brewing in the community. In 2020, a team of glitch hunters consisting of Kuma, Ace Zephyr and Mitsudo would find a new setup for Cosmo Canyon Skip. 
If you position the buggy in a precise location next to the malfunction trigger, you can get out of it, then back in, and skip the trigger altogether. This version doesn't require a chocobo, so you no longer had to wait for a specific time to force the encounter, but you were still required to press cardinal directions on the controller. And to avoid random battles, runners get out of the buggy along the way, as this has an effect on overworld encounters that let you avoid them. Zeal wasn't the only person pushing the time lower. Caleb Hart 42 had a time just 5 seconds away from a sub 7, and with the new Cosmo Canyon skip, he aimed to break the barrier and dethrone Zeal. Leaving Midgar, he's almost 20 seconds ahead, and a second try poison on bottom swell is huge, as it lets him save a minute and 20 seconds for a massive gold split. If he keeps this pace, not only will he sub 7, he'll beat Zeal by about a minute. He has no trouble with the new Cosmo Canyon skip, and the run goes on a bit of a roller coaster ride from here, as he bounces between being 1 and 2 minutes ahead. Some splits he gains, and others he loses, and going into carry armor, he's 2 minutes ahead. This is one of the last bosses that can end his run. Wow, Tifa, come on. What the f is this? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Nine straight misses from Tifa bleed off a full minute of time. He still has a chance, but can't afford any more mishaps. Diamond Weapon kills Tifa, which loses 20 more seconds. At this point, Hojo needs to cooperate. If not, he won't have to worry about beating Zeal. He might not even sub 7. No, dude, man, God. you gotta be kidding me. Dude, no. Four misses on Hojo. Unfortunately for Caleb, his chance at the record was over. He still had a shot at sub-7, however, so he pressed on. He calculates his final descent, and it wasn't looking good, so he took a time loss to manipulate it down to a 2 encounter. And with just 6 seconds to spare, he enters the boss rush. He's 3 seconds ahead. No room for mistakes. He lost 5 seconds. He needs to find 2 seconds of time save on Safer Sephiroth or he'll come up short. But he does have one hope. If Sephiroth targets Cloud or Tifa with Shadow Flare, he'll need to spend time healing, which will kill his sub-7. But if he targets Sid, he can avoid the time loss and save about 13 seconds. Miss. Come on! Miss! With that, Caleb would become the second person on Earth to set a sub-7, and while not a world record, he has one of the most wholesome reactions I've ever seen in speedrunning. It's like a huge weight just got lifted off my sh shoulders, man. I like to use this cutscene as like, like, sh that we go through. Eventually, it gets better. Caleb's run shows perfectly how the game can take away time through no fault of your own. And using the improved Cosmo Canyon skip, Zeal drops the record two more times, with the second improvement being a 6.55.51. A runner named Dummy Bear would set the third sub-7 in this period, but moving into October, the run would get turned on its head once again. In October, Kuma would discover something peculiar with how the world map renders triangles and stores the one you're standing on in memory. The technical details are quite complicated, but the gist of it is that by dismounting a chocobo on one side of the marsh, running to the other side, then running back and mounting it as the Zolom encounter happens, you can get the chocobo in a glitch state when the battle is over. Once in this state, Kuma found a route that got you into a specific position all for the purpose of arriving at this river. If everything was done correctly, when you dismount the chocobo, you'll find yourself in the ground, 
and if you move along a precise path, you can cross the river. This gets you to Junon, skipping the Mithril Mine, Calm, and the flashback sequence with Photo Skip, making it the biggest skip in the game, with 18 minutes of content being eliminated. The glitch did come with risks, however. The setup was quite meticulous, with lots of spots for errors to creep in, and you could become stuck in the ground at the river and softlock, which killed the run. This softlock is precisely what happened to RJ the Destroyer, and while frustrating, he didn't let it get to him too much and booted up another run. It doesn't start off the greatest, as he's almost 50 seconds in the red leaving Midgar, but this gives him another shot at the calm skip, provided he doesn't softlock a second time. It took 8 tries to initiate the glitch, and once he arrived at the river, he made it through, avoiding the softlock. He turned the 50 seconds of red into a huge 15 minute time save. He keeps this pace all the way to the end, where he sets a final time of 6.49.50. From a softlock to a record is quite impressive, and having streamed 9 hours of the game already, he opted to raid Dummy Bear instead of doing a run back, and what happened next was nothing short of amazing. Dummy Bear hit Calm Skip on his second try, and when he was in the Genova fight was when RJ would set the record. Dummy Bear's PB was just 3 minutes behind RJ's new time, and coming out of the fight, he had built up a good pace. It was just before Cosmo Canyon Skip that RJ's raid would come in, and despite the pressure from the new viewers, he executes the skip flawlessly. Moving deeper, we see he's just under 3 minutes ahead after Demon's Gate. At this pace, he's only 30 seconds behind RJ's record, only a few more things need to go his way. The only time losses he does see are limited to about 20 seconds, and after a perfect final descent minute, he only has the boss rush left. He PBs by an incredible 4.5 minutes, lowering the record by a minute and 1 second, and cutting RJ's reign as number 1 to just 5 hours. It was the fastest world record turnaround in Final Fantasy VII history. Zeal would set a 3 minute record 5 days later. Things were moving very fast for the speedrun, and they were about to get faster because Kuma found a new setup for Calm Skip. Instead of going to the river, Kuma found that you could dismount the chocobo at the mithril mines and walk through the mountains using the same exploit as before. The setup was faster, but it also had a risk. If you got an encounter while inside of the mountain, you would become stuck when the battle was over, killing the run. This was found in early November, and Zeal would use it to push the time all the way down to a 6.37.25, realizing the full 18 minutes of time save from when it was first discovered. The run was done on December 10th, 2021, and the record wouldn't budge for several months. It was very optimized at this point, but there was one time save left to be routed in. It had been known about for a while, but was by no means easy to implement. I'm talking about Elevator Manip. When you enter the Shinra building in Midgar, you have the option of taking the elevator or going up the stairs. If you take the stairs, there aren't any encounters, and you have a long dialogue sequence as you climb to the top, whereas the elevator can be shorter, but has the chance for random encounters, unless you arrive on floors where Hito greets you. You probably know where I'm going with this. Since there was a chance of encounters, that meant they could be manipulated. But just like Final Descent, these weren't the easiest to influence, and the method of doing it was by no means a cakewalk. It involves triggering a battle inside of the elevator and then using menuing and the position of Cloud's hair to adjust your RNG on the fly, with a perfect elevator having one battle followed by three Hito encounters. But before any of that takes place, you need to video record a waterfall earlier in the game so you can know your RNG's starting value. Players watch back the recording in slow-mo during cutscenes and are looking to track the intervals between the particle glows in the waterfall, as these are determined by the RNG value you're trying to deduce. Once this is complete, you enter the values you found into a spreadsheet that tells you what manipulation you have to perform once inside the elevator, with all of the effort culminating in a time save of a single minute. It's worth noting that Carnage is the only runner to have a perfect unmanipulated elevator, which is about a 1 in 1800 chance, and given the difficulty of the manip itself, it was going to take someone very dedicated to route this in. Enter Zeal, and what is likely the greatest Final Fantasy VII speedrun of all time. August 8th would be a day 25 years in the making, 
with every skip and trick covered so far being routed into a run. In the first leg of the game, he was ahead on every split on his way out of Midgar. He nailed Calm Skip first try, and when he fights Bottom Swell, Poison sticks on the first cast. He was over a minute ahead in the first hour and a half. He gets asked how low he thinks the run can go with current strats, and has this to say. I think realistically like a 33 is still doable. If you get like no bad splits, you get a 33 also. He doesn't lose time until the Genova birth fight, but it's only a single second, and in the Coral Mountains, he manages to steal a right arm. Things got really interesting when he arrived at the run killer duo, Red Dragon and Demon's Gate, with near perfect fights on both bosses. The run was officially a juggernaut. Amazingly, the Molotov that Kate sifted through needed to be the killing blow since Big Guard had run out. Had it not, Demon's Gate would have hit for 800 on his next attack and ended the run. There was also a concern in Gaia's Cliff. Because he was so far ahead, things with the step count can get a bit wonky, so there was a chance he would encounter a Marlborough, an enemy that's potentially dangerous due to its bad breath attack that can inflict various status ailments. Zeal performs some routing on the fly and turns the would-be Malboro encounter into an enemy he can easily flee from, showing the importance of not just understanding what a trick skips, but how it works as well. This plus two minute pace would be carried through the entire game. When Zeal faced a run killer, he obliterated it. When he faced a pace killer, he set a gold split. Nothing was going to stop him. Going into the safer Sephiroth fight, there was one scenario where the run could die. If Cloud got hit by Shadow Flare and died, the normal attack that followed would hit Sid and paralyze him, which would have the fight spiral out of control. This was the last hurdle he needed to jump. Don't do it. Don't, 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 don't do it. Don't, don't do it. He's doing it. The fate of the run was now sealed. Nice! 633.44. Nice! Let's go. That was so good. One, one run. Looking back on Zeal's run, the amount of things that went right are astounding. With only a handful of splits causing major time loss, he lost 14 seconds learning the laser skill due to the manipulate failing repeatedly and a full minute to Materia Keeper due to poison not sticking until the fifth attempt. Schizo was another big time loss due to Tifa missing her first four death blows with the fight stealing 38 seconds, and on Hojo, he had the potential to save 20 seconds. But with six misses from Tifa, he lost 26 instead. And that's it for time losses. Aside from a couple seconds here and there, this run was that solid. It was the culmination of 25 years of knowledge cultivated by players that held the game in the highest esteem. From humble beginnings on internet forums, the speedrun went from a fast, glitchless playthrough to the run you saw today. Thanks for watching.